You can take two, three, four, or five people and you can build a 25, 30, 50 million dollar SaaS company. It's just never going to be a public company. Right. Um, it's never going to be a multi, multi billion dollar It's just dollar never going to be a multi billion dollar company. company. Successful, profitable, smaller company. Yeah. It means that, you know, you and your buddies are going to argue over how to split 30 million dollars a year, you know, in profit. Like, okay. <laughs> like, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 48 of the Atlas Pod. I am Tobias. What's up, guys? I'm Shaval. Happy New Year. Happy Very New Year, man. Be pissed because I think it's, yeah, 12. <laughs> so we're saying Happy New Year. We're, we're beyond the, the cutoff. <laughs> <laughs> well, still, man, it's it's good to be back in person. It is great to be back in person. How was your holidays? It was good, man. I was out in Jersey. Man, I, I've never appreciated the LA weather more. I think for the first year, I felt like I was hoodwinked. There was like unprecedented rain and whatever, but like now coming back and it's like, what, 65 yeah. and sunny here. Um, I'm very happy. How about you? Where you notice it is the fact that in the Northeast, it gets dark at legit 4 p.m. It was literally four o'clock and I'm looking outside and it's pitch black. Yeah. We have, you know, one of our designers is based <laughs> out of New York and wherever we're doing Zooms in his office, it's noon here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alex. <laughs> it looks like it's the middle of the night over there. And I'm just like, man, I cannot believe I did a decade there. But. Yeah. No, it was good. We went to uh, we went to Dallas, Texas, where Rain was the star of the show. Of course, you know. So they I saw some out. of those pictures, man. Ridiculous in the sled, Ridiculous. in everything. Adorable, adorable. But I mean, like, just talk about over the top. <laughs> talk about an over the top Christmas that he'll not remember. Dude, that Christmas tree you guys had was sick. So Kim's mom massive. is the like Christmas decoration goat. <laughs> she is the best. I tell her every year, this is a business. You need to be running it. You need to like tell people well, you, ahead You know of what time. I was very impressed by? On, under the tree that you guys had, yeah. there was a bunch of presents, of course, and a very good haul for yeah, whoever was participating really good haul, there. Yeah. But the presents were all like perfectly in like white and gold wrapping paper, I think. Like, so we have like a, a memo <laughs> every year okay. where like the theme, she switches off between white Christmas and the more traditional kind of green and red. Right. But the wrapping paper memo goes out, and you're not allowed to use any other. If you have a different paper. wrapping paper, you're not getting under the tree. You have to put those presents <laughs> off the side. Those are the ones that Santa dropped off the sleigh, and they landed on the yeah. side of the house. If they go under the tree, they have to be uniform in terms of their wrapping. Obviously, you know, makes for nicer pictures. Yeah, it, well, it was beautiful. Well done to her. <laughs> Great. Well, we're happy to be back. Uh, I guess really this is basically season two, episode 48. For those of you that are new to the show, Cheval and I are the founders of Atlas. We are a next-gen wealth management, wealth and asset management company. We represent high, ultra high net worth, high net worth individuals, families, athletes, entertainers. We have a financial planning business, an investment management business where we invest in everything from stocks and bonds to venture capital and private equity. And every week we do the show to break down what's happening in the world and how we are navigating it from an investment standpoint. So with that, Let's crack the first Bev of the year. Let's do it, man. Of course, celebratory Bev, first one of the year. Also a very big week, so I can say I'm very happy. Oh, yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Back to the tried and true. It's a little fruity, though. Yeah. It says it has, like, some citrus elements as well. What do we got here? Happy... Happy pills. Happy pills. Yeah, like Pilsner. Yeah. But also ah, got happy it. pills. Okay. Um... Yeah, no, it's a it's a big week. I'm very happy. I've been very excited with some of the news that we're going to get into today, um, al along with just being a new year, man, season two. I know, man. We made it. Here we go. <laughs> so uh, we did the prediction episode the last week of uh, 2023. Here we are in the first or second week of 2024, and one of the predictions already came true. The Bitcoin ETF is officially approved. Now, Bitcoin initially traded up as high as 49000 on the fake announcement, <laughs> <laughs> of course, this could never, you know, this couldn't happen so smooth, fitting, right? so fitting for Bitcoin. So for anyone that didn't see this, uh, Gary Gensler's uh, Twitter account was hacked. Someone then put out a statement on Twitter X saying that the B Bitcoin ETF had been approved. It had not been approved. So then the SEC's Twitter account had to issue a statement saying, nope, it hasn't been approved only to then a day later actually make the approval. So the, the Bitcoin Trading market went to 49,000, went to 46 on the announcement, so actually traded off, and now I think it's trading at 43. Well, well trust, trust it to be Gary, the one who 
is in charge of protecting our financial markets, can't even protect his own Twitter account. <laughs> set up set up two FA, Gary. Like, come on. I know I know you I know you only have like, you know, a certain number of months left before you're out of office, but come on. <laughs> protect protect yourself before you try to protect us. So what do you make of this? I mean, how big of a deal is it? Um, are you surprised by the sort of muted reaction? I think it's fair to say in terms of the price action. And what do you make so far of the volume that's been trading? Uh, I'm not surprised by what's happened. Obviously, mm -hmm. we've been talking about this for quite a while. I had called out the January 10th date many times, obviously, nice. courtesy of you know Eric Belchunas uh, over at Bloomberg, but not surprised by that. It what is, is, just real quick, how did you know that it was January 10th? That was that was the deadline. That was a deadline for the Got it. first, uh, which would be ARC, the first ETF to be approved mm -hmm. uh, or denied, obviously. Um, and we started to see rumblings, um, obviously with BlackRock coming into the mix and others that the SEC would do a blanket approval of multiple ETFs at the same time. So as not to favor ARC or anyone else, uh, you know, just the first mover advantage in these things can be quite large. So they wanted to give everyone a fair shot. So they approved a bunch of them at once. So it is, it is huge in terms of the, you know, progression of Bitcoin. When you look at folks like Larry Fink, who years ago said that this would be you know, solely a tool used for illicit activity and fraud to him, like completely doing a 180 and now launching his own ETF right. um, under the iShares banner. Um, the trading volume was massive, I think four and a half billion or so on the first day uh, in totality. XGBTC, that's, you know, two and a half billion. And we can talk about why we would look at it. XGBTC smashes the record overall, if you consider them uh, to be kind of trading in totality previously held by Bitto, which was a Bitcoin futures ETF. So super, super successful launch, I would say. Uh, we can obviously cover some of the, you know, more nuanced uh, takes there. But I think overall, from a marketing perspective, from a volume perspective, from a number of trades perspective, flows, media coverage, everything, I would say it was an absolute smashing success. Now, to your question about why was the price reaction muted, I think this is just one of those things where, People had been aware that this was going to happen, so there's a bit of a sell the news, uh, buy the rumor, sell the news element here. Yep. But also, this is just a long term play. Like when right. it comes to investing, we always we always uh, hammer down this point: you need to take a long term view on markets. This is no different. Obviously, the first day there's a lot of shuffling. GBTC came in with 28 billion dollars in volume, so like you know, some people are moving out of GBTC into these other ETFs. So like from a net flows perspective the impact is muted. But just think about the long-term picture, the amount of institutions and retail investors that are going to come in. Yeah. It's going to be massive. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, the first thing that stands out is one, it's a gold star to the United States of America. When you think about the fact that a private company, Grayscale, sued their regulator, the SEC, and won, which means that they had to get a federal judge to be able to side with them against the regulator that has domain and authority over all of their activity. Um, that is a purely American thing. Like, I don't know. I, I looked briefly. If anybody can find an example, please put it in the comments of any other country in the world where a company has sued the government <laughs> and won in order to be able to drive forward uh, the advancements in an asset class that's even a half as big as, as this. So it took a long time, but we got there. And I think, you know, there's a reason why the windshield is bigger than the rearview mirror. So when you're looking forward, this opens up, I don't know, five, seven, ten trillion dollars of assets that are going to be flowing into the space. Um, I've also noticed a lot of people that have been posting on Twitter X that some of their 401k IRA providers are actually not allowing them to yeah, buy. Vanguard, Vanguard has gated yeah. access to it. So which Vanguard, huge, which is huge mistake. Huge mistake. I mean, I, presumably because I don't think Vanguard's ETF is approved, right? Well, yeah, they don't. They, they don't, don't have, have an one. ETF in the market. So, you know, they're either waiting for theirs to be approved and then presumably trying to trying to push all of their clients into their ETF um, or for whatever reason, you know, they just don't support Bitcoin. <laughs> I'm not really sure. But either way, um, it's another it's another sort of impediment towards the immediacy of the price reaction. I did look at all of the different fees associated with this. And one of the things I, I think I'd love to get your your view on is Grayscale stands out. GBTC is uh, a one and a half percent management fee. And then you've got hashtags at 90 bibs and Vesco's 39. And then it goes all the way down to ARC 21, which is at 21 basis point and bitwise at 20. So why do you think there's such disparity in terms of the fee structure here? And is this ultimately a race to the bottom? And we're basically going to see a zero fee 
BT, BTC ETF in the very near future. So uh, let, let me address the grayscale topic first. Yeah. The, as you said, it's six, it sticks out like a sore thumb at yeah. one and a half percent. So Grayscale's product, GBTC, uh, prior to conversion to an ETF, had a fee of 2%, mm -hmm. which is egregious. And they were just milking that thing for the cash for, for years. $28 billion in assets, 2% fee. You can you can do the math there. Yeah. Um, the reason they... So they lowered their fee to 1.5%. So everyone looking at that is like, what the hell? Why would you like? Why would you still try to maintain such a high fee when you have competitors as low as 20 bips? Well, look at it from their perspective. They, they're milking money out of this thing still. So like, it's not like everyone is going to trade out of GBTC into one of the other ETF products on right. day one. So they're they're going to hold on to that one. And it a ends half up percent. being it ends up literally being like around a million and a half dollars a day in revenue. Yeah, to so them. it's it's a massive source of revenue for them. They're not just going to give that up and say, "All right, we're dropping the fee to twenty bits." Right. They're going to be forced. Yeah, to they're going to wait till yeah. like the very last day that they can they can do this. You know, there have been theories posited that they will actually launch a second product, a second ETF product under the ticker BTC, which they have, um, which will be like a low fee alternative, but they're not going to force <laughs> force the issue. Like right. they want to hold on to that one and a half percent. So that's why they stick out. Now, with respect to the others, this is one of the this is one of the great things about having a product like Bitcoin or an asset like Bitcoin in an ETF wrapper because it's so much better for the investors than whatever else was out there. Like twenty bips is extremely low fee for a product. It'll never go to zero because there are costs associated with it. Like all these guys are paying, uh, or like eight out of. I think eight out of ten of them are using Coinbase as a custodian. I was going to ask, so like you know, so like I, it like, seems to me that that Coinbase is the ultimate winner here because no matter how many assets flow in, as you mentioned, eighty percent of those assets are ultimately custodied at at Coinbase. But unlike most custodians who are able to lend out in the in the equity space, do securities lending, and then capture whatever the securities lending rate is for that particular stock, Bitcoin you can't do that, right? right? So I mean, they're basically charging. They're charging the manager a fee. Presumably, that fee is it's at like high. Yeah, it's at like high single digit basis points. So like about like eight, eight to nine bips. They're right. charging the custo uh, custodial. So fee. not super lucrative for the for yeah. the manager. Like w I would estimate that that would generate like somewhere between like twenty five and thirty million dollars in revenue for them this year. Uh, there's also like an additional effect if we're talking about Coinbase where they may capture some additional institutional trading revenue as yep. a result of the launch of the ETF. Yep. That could be in the realm of around $200 million this year. So like from a revenue perspective- not, And that's just because they have more liquidity now. It, well, yeah, there's more. There's just more people buying, yeah. uh, buying the asset now. You know, not crazy material from a revenue perspective. It's going to be like a single digit percent of revenue growth for them. Um, so, you know, I think we, we did pretty well holding Coinbase last yeah. year. <laughs> Uh, I'd be looking to trim a little bit, uh, given, given the current state. And I think we're going to like this week, the stock is down 15% already. Um, but you know, there's still a bull case to be seen for, uh, Coinbase just because a lot of their biggest competition is gone, evaporated, disappeared. Uh, also the crypto bull market when it returns, which, you know, clearly we're, we're well on, on the way to that. Uh, they will capture a significant amount of trading activity there. Their take rate, um, is about 180 basis points. So, higher than it was in the last bull market. So there's still there's still a bull case to be had for Coinbase. Um, but I think the effect of the ETF uh, in people's minds is actually exceeding what the revenue impact will be in real life. Yeah. And this also kicks off what is probably going to be uh, the largest marketing campaign in the history of finance, right? You've got 10, 15 companies that are either have their approvals already, already done or in the very near future will have the approval and all of them want to get assets into their ETF. So these things are more or less the same with the exception of of the fee structure associated with it. So in order to win, it's really a marketing game, yep. um, which is going to bring massive amounts of awareness. And I think the fact that now this is an SEC approved asset class changes the dynamic associated with how serious people need to take this. When I say people, I mean like older people who, let's be honest, like still have the majority of the money in this country. Um, and it's, it's basically a marketing campaign that Bitcoin doesn't pay for. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, it's, it's amazing for adoption coming back to the fees, as you just mentioned, like all the, a lot of these people who are like, you know, 50 plus 60 plus who control a significant amount of wealth in this yeah. country, they use financial advisors to manage their money. Obviously we have a financial advisory practice as well. The 
product that has the lowest fees is the most attractive to the financial advisor. So yep. we've seen, in addition to just having low fees, like uh, Bitwise has a 20 basis points fee, a lot of these guys have done fee waivers. Six out of 11 are doing fee waivers where effectively you're paying nothing for the first, you know, they have like asset thresholds or time thresholds. So like in BlackRock's case, which I was shocked to see them do a fee waiver because typically in other products, you only do a fee waiver on an ETF if you're kind of like a small, unknown player and you just yeah. need like something to drive volume. In this case, everyone out the gate is doing the fee waiver, including BlackRock, which is like, you know, the most skilled player in this space. So BlackRock's also going through a bit. Of, it seems like they're going through a bit of a difficult period of time right now. I mean, I looked at the total number of assets in ETF products. BlackRock had a huge head start with the iShares business versus Vanguard. Vanguard, because of the pricing dynamics, yep. if you look at the charts, they're converging you know, the wrong way for BlackRock. BlackRock's going down. Vanguard's going up. Seems like Vanguard will ultimately become the largest ETF manager uh, in the world probably this year, if not definitely next year. And their whole claim to fame is that they're doing this you know, at close to zero cost. They monetize it on the back end, but it, as it relates to what the, what the end client pays, Pays, it's zero. So to me, you know, I, I think this is great for Bitcoin as an asset class. I don't think it's great for the managers, though. Yeah. I mean, right now, a lot of these guys are probably doing this below cost. Um, yeah. So, like, the revenue opportunity here is one of scale. So that's why it's so important to, you know, have a successful launch, have successful marketing play, which Bitwise, by the way, captured the most net flows. So, like, there's a difference between volume and flows. Obviously, yep. volume is just like the trading activity. But if you want to really look at like the organic growth of the space, you need to look at the net flows. Bitwise actually doubled BlackRock despite having way lower uh, trading volume in terms of the net flows. So they had, I think, 220 odd million on the first day of net new flows. Wow. Whereas BlackRock only had about 111. So they did a really good job with seeding the ETF, which we can talk about, uh, as well as the marketing. You know, we we shared a video about like a month ago that they had the most interesting yeah. man in the world uh, <laughs> talking about it. So like they did a really good job of marketing. They did a really good job of, you know, lowering the fee. They have a zero. Basically, you're paying nothing if you're in the first three months. And then I think their threshold is like five billion or so. Um, so yeah, Bitwise, Bitwise did an incredible job. They were kind of the biggest winner yesterday. Yeah. And it also feels to me like that that actually speaks to the fact that it's already people that are familiar with crypto that are buying these because Bitwise, you know, traditionally has been a very crypto centric company, for as sure. the name would imply. Uh, BlackRock known for a number of different things. So the fact that Bitwise is getting more net inflows than BlackRock is just telling me, like looking at it from the outside looking in, that their embedded audience that they already have is now flocking to a Bitwise product. And we haven't reached that point in time where all the 401k, IRA, you know, various taxable and non-taxable account managers um, are actually selling their product effectively. Like it takes a long time sure. for this to work through the kind of traditional RIA wealth management space because we have advisors that need to call their clients and re repurpose their portfolio. Say, hey, just so you know, I'm sure you saw on CNBC or in the Wall Street Journal or whatever that these ETFs are approved. You know, I think that we should have 5% exposure, 10% exposure, whatever the number is. That takes days, weeks, months. It doesn't happen instantaneously. For sure. And it's, you know, it's incredible to see how successful this first day was. Like, you know, because this was a telegraphed event, I think for many people who are kind of in the know, the issuers had the opportunity to line up assets. So, mm -hmm. You know, we've we've spoken at length uh, about launching an ETF ourselves, so we kind of have a, you know, deep understanding of how this works. But the idea of seeding the ETF is very important. So if you actually looked closely at the trading activity ahead of the market open yesterday, the first day of trading, BlackRock already had, you know, $10 million in the ETF at 6 a.m. And by the time the uh, the market opened around 9.30, they, I think they had somewhere around uh, $100 million in there. So you want to use flows as the ultimate marketing tool yep. in an ETF. Like nothing speaks better than flows. Right. So when people see a lot of trading activity, a lot of flows into the asset, your job as a marketer is a lot easier. So if you're like a huge player like BlackRock, you've been talking to your institutional investor clients for months ahead of this, lining up the assets, and then there's a bit of a game to be played. So let's say you've lined up a billion dollars in interest in your new ETF product. Now you're going you to convert it. <laughs> you, got, you convert it, but you don't drop it in all at once, right? right. You, you kind of leg into that trade and you do it over a period of time. Uh, some, you know, some issuers would do it on the first day, depending on the volume, I would say. And talk about why, why you want to do it over time. So you, you just want to show, you just want to show traders, market makers, market participants that this is a, you know, highly liquid 
highly uh, traded asset. And you want to show consistent activity. Yeah. So if you look at the trading activity on the first day, like between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m., it like had a nice smooth uptick towards 100 million. Yeah. By the end of the day, they were trading over a billion dollars in volume. It's a nice smooth uptick. If I were BlackRock, I would, you know, kind of keep some ammo in the tank over the course of the following days as well. I don't know exactly, you know, how they manage that, but it'll be interesting to see what happens, you know, a week from now, yeah. two weeks from now, two months from now, like how how the trading activity shakes out. And this is something that we do in the equity space when we do IPOs. We always have a green shoe, which is the over allotment that we use to be able to protect deal price. And if the stock goes below the IPO price, then you're allowed to be able to use the shoe to be able to buy it back. If it goes higher, you can sell it to be able to replenish the shoe. If it goes down, you just return those shares to the company. Um, so yeah, I mean, like market making in this, making sure that the stock behaves well uh, is a is a concerted effort. So when does this then shift the focus to the Ethereum yeah. ETF? I mean, look, when we were when we were talking, me, you, and Maddie a couple of days ago uh, ahead of the launch, like when there was a fake announcement, one of the first things I said was, as soon as this goes through, which obviously it was about to go through, the fo the narrative is going to shift to the Ethereum ETF. Yeah, <laughs> crypto and even markets in general, but specifically crypto is all about the narrative. So sure enough, now that this ETF is in the market. Larry Fink, uh, head of BlackRock, this morning on uh, CNBC said, I would, uh, I would be in favor of an Ethereum ETF. Yeah, now, keep Larry. in mind, it was Larry who, back in June, submitted the application for a Bitcoin ETF that kicked off this whole frenzy. You know, Everyone started putting in their applications, folks who had been denied in the past. Obviously, this all crescendoed yesterday uh, when the ETF started trading. So now he's saying, you know, I, I think a, I think an Ethereum ETF might be nice. Like we're gonna see, we're gonna see the same thing happen. You know, he he even has come out and said he believes in tokenization. Uh, this morning he was out there saying that he believes that crypto uh, is actually very useful in countries if you're fearful of your government. Maybe that's why China has banned it. Like this is Larry Fink, the same guy who was calling it, you know, poison a few years ago. So right. I wouldn't be surprised if we see in the coming months, you know, an Ethereum ETF launch as well. Um, probably take a little bit of time there as well. But ideally, though, faster than what we had for, I mean, yeah. like, I mean, the first it, Bitcoin ETF application was right. submitted in 2018. It's been like five six years. years five, right. Six yeah. Years. So, so, the, okay. So then, like, I think, you know, in terms of the Ethereum ETF, we're talking months, maybe a year, you know, something like that, not another six years, presumably. Yeah. Presumably, that would be the case. And it was interesting to see, uh, you know, our good friend Gary G, Gary G. Voted, voted in favor of approving the Bitcoin ETF. So uh, the, the SEC had five commissioners, two of which are Democrats, two of which are Republicans. The Democrats voted against, the Republicans voted in favor. And then Gary G was a swing vote. He, of course, voted in favor. And that's why we have the approval here. But you know, it, it was, his hand was forced and he put out some statements kind of trying yeah. to, you know, mute, uh, mute the euphoria there and say, you know, like I, you be careful if you're investing in crypto, but the courts had ruled in favor. Right. Uh, he really had no choice. His hands were tied. So interesting. So then what do you think this means for the altcoin space? Side note, <laughs> um, I saw an analysis uh, that was done on FTX's holdings from when they first had, you know, the bombshell issue back mm -hmm. in November of 2022 to today, their mark to market would be up. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, look, there, there's so you been talk about like just bad timing. Like, obviously, they committed crimes, they deserve what they got. Like, that is what it is. But it also does go to show you that everyone rushed to go and liquidate all of the, the holdings that they had to be able to get back cents on the dollar. I'm not sure where the liquidation currently stands right now, but had the portfolio not been touched, they would be up mark to market yeah, this today. Is this was Sam's hope all along. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I think, I think the altcoin space is already like ripped Solana. Solana, I think is up 500%. Um, that's one of the, that's one of the higher quality ones too, you know? Yeah. So. I mean, yeah, Solana has legitimate partnerships. They have yeah. an NFT ecosystem. Avalanche was up about eight, 180% versus Bitcoin. Um, you know, it was only around a hundred percent. So, you know, it, these, these altcoins have the potential to rip again, which is why I say Coinbase could capture, you know, some pretty Additional pretty hefty trading, trading revenue. revenues. Uh, personally, you know, I think there's a divide between Bitcoin and everything else when it comes to crypto. Uh, Ethereum is kind of, you know, somewhere in that space. But yeah, I think I think there's an opportunity for for altcoins to to move ahead uh, as as the euphoria mounts. All right, good. So moving to uh, a company that had a rough week, Carta, <laughs> our friends at Carta. So just for anyone that doesn't know, Carta is the cap table management software that I think about 50 to 55% of the entire startup ecosystem uses. 
Um, they put out their Q4 data on startups. I want to get to that. But before we get to the Q4 data on startups, we got to talk about the disaster that unfolded. Brand new year. You come in, you're all fired up to go and crush it. <laughs> Boom. Twitter fiasco to start. So Carta runs, obviously, a cap table management business. We're a customer of Carta. So they have all of our our data associated with every shareholder that we have in our company, which is not public information, on a database. And that is supposed to be confidential and privileged. Can you can you just talk for a second about why we or any startup needs a company like Carta? Like what do we what value do we get out of it or like what is the service that they're offering to Sure. You? Yeah. So you use it to be able to issue shares in your company and to have a central point of truth associated with who owns what. Um, that is, you know, backed by a, a legitimate company that's doing all of the accounting, all of the legal, all of the compliance. This stuff is pretty complicated. I mean, prior to Carta, when I say that people were literally managing their cap tables, which is the ownership of companies that could potentially be worth billions of dollars, either by hand or in Microsoft Excel, that's not an exaggeration. So, you know, you go through multiple rounds of financing where you're issuing, in, in some cases, tens of millions of shares. And someone says, yeah, well, you know, like I'm in for X, Y, Z amount go through a few rounds and there's a completely, you know, there's a completely uh, different view of like who owns what in a non-Carta world. So this is a place where you can go and it shows you exactly what you own. It shows you the breakdown of the cap table all by round. So like from your pre-seed to your seed, your series A. And then if you want to issue new shares to incoming employees, you can do that. If you want to retire shares, you can do that. And since then, they've been able to build on a number of different services. One of the services that they have gotten into is the secondary markets liquidity business. And I know a lot about this because I built out the first institutional trading desk for private market shares when I was at Barclays. And the idea there was pretty simple. It was that you had a bunch of hedge funds who wanted to buy stocks pre-IPO, and you had a bunch of venture capitalists who wanted to sell their shares in startups because they'd held them for longer than what they thought the lifespan of the fund was going to be. So typically when you invest in a venture fund, it's got a seven to 10 year lifespan. A lot of these funds still had uh, assets on the books that might've been 12, 13, 14 years old. So they wanted to get that money out of, the, out of their fund, return it to investors so that they could do the next fund, so on and so forth. So the problem with doing that from like an institutional perspective at a place like Barclays is you have no visibility into who owns the shares. So how do you get the supply? Well, you go on to LinkedIn or, you know, you do whatever means necessary in order to be able, you call up a friend and say, hey, you know, you invested in SpaceX. Like, do you remember who else was on the cap table? Blah, blah, blah. Sometimes they're helpful. Sometimes they're not. And is then that, you, Is that what you guys were doing when you first set this up at Barclays? Was it really like- Usually you have a relationship. Ground? So usually you have a relationship with uh, either management and so like in some cases, if there, if there's already an investment banker that's assigned to the company and the company is involved in the transaction, the company may say, Hey, like we want to do a secondary in order to be able to give our employees liquidity. Will you go and line up buyers? In that case, like you're, you're good to go. There's nothing, there's no issue yeah, with the that. The company is kind of like involved in the, the company is involved. The problem is that you want to trade a lot of times stock wants to trade without the company being involved. <laughs> okay. So Carta decided that this was going to be a good business. And on paper, it would have been a great business because they have a material competitive advantage, which is they know who owns the stock. They have all the they data. They have all the data, right? <laughs> so the the issue here was that a Carta employee reached out to unknowingly to him, reached out to a family member of a CEO of a company called Linear and basically asked them if they wanted to sell their stock and had given them details around the price that they could transact and a buyer and all this stuff. And our understanding, like meaning like, you know, Atlas's understanding of how our cap table is managed is that it, it's closed off. Like there's no, Nobody there's not a free flow it. of information where like somebody at Carta is actively trying to move around the shares on our cap table without our knowledge. Um, and that's the, that's the sort of view of all companies, right? But in this case, the family member reached out to the CEO, sent forward in that email, which he then screenshot and put on to X, which set off this whole disastrous scenario. Fast forward a couple of days, Carta gets out of the liquidity business as a result of this. Well, qu quite, a, quite a saga there. I mean, why, why were they doing this? Like, according to what I read, and we spoke about this a few yeah. days ago, like, they have they generate like somewhere in the range of three hundred or so million dollars in recurring revenue, and then this secondary trading business was only like three million dollars for them. Yeah, like 
for such an immaterial amount of revenue, why take the risk of breaking trust with all of your current customers? Like, yeah. why do you think they were doing this? So it's a great question. So they, like, he actually, the CEO of the, of the company put out numbers uh, in conjunction with this, I think, because all of his investors were probably like, dude, you just killed the company, whatever. So they're doing like $200 million a year in cap table management. We pay a flat fee. So it's not um, based on like how much value your company has. That doesn't go into what you pay Carta. They also have a $100 million a year fund admin business. So if you're running a venture capital fund or whatever, obviously you're going to be investing in a lot of startups. Doing a fund admin through Carta seems to make sense. So that's $300 million in recurring revenue. Um, and then they have like a $20 million a year private equity business. And then this business, as you mentioned, the liquidity business was doing about 3 million bucks. So why would you be in the liquidity business? Well, in totality, when you look at the total value of startup shares that are on your platform, it's many, many billions of dollars and no one else is really positioned to trade those. And the commission on that is still like 5% on each side. So if you do a $100 million transaction, you're going to make 10%. Five on each side, so that's 10 million bucks. So in theory, and this has always been the pitch that Carta, I think, has given to newer investors during their growth round, that business would eventually be the biggest business that they have. The issue is how do you grow that business without betraying the trust <laughs> of your customer? Off, without like kind of hurting your other your other main business. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I think, I think this is public, so I don't feel like I'm talking too out of school on this. Like Goldman Sachs, a big investor in Carta. So like they obviously have been encouraging them to trade more so that they have more data and more visibility associated with it. So I, I don't know. So the answer is like, I think they, they probably looked at it and they said, okay, we have $500 billion or whatever the number is in value on this, on, on our platform. If we can get, you know, 10% of that, so $50 billion a year or whatever to transact, and we can take 10% of that. We had a $5 billion a year business just in secondary trading. Like, I think that's like the I dream. Mean, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty massive uh, source of revenue then at scale. And I think their last round was in 2021, Carta itself, a venture-backed yeah. business. Um, I think they raised it around $7.5 billion. So what do you think this means for their valuation? Like how much of that valuation was ascribed to this scaling of this like secondary trading business and now yeah. that he's saying we're shutting it down like ultimately like this i presume it would result in a you know material haircut on their valuation but what do you think about that yeah i think it, i think it definitely takes away um a large potential upside as it relates to what the valuation could have been um because this business is like something that in theory it has like all the markings of what you're looking for from a venture scalable business which is like you started with one product that gave you a competitive and sustainable moat to be able to launch product number two it's extremely high gross margin like there's really nothing that anybody can do to to sort of eat away at that because they don't have the same data that you do so you know it really just becomes like a monetization execution exercise and now that goes away um, so it, it takes away a lot. The other piece of this is that the competitors that have started up cap table management companies are vicious. <laughs> Savages. I mean, I got inbounds from Fidelity <laughs> this week. I got inbounds from AngelList this week. All of them saying like, hey, I don't know if you've seen this Carta fiasco posting the, the headlines. We'll manage your cap table <laughs> for free. Now they have like before, when I looked at this before, because like we pay Carta quite a bit. I think it's like $10,000 a year. Um, before when I looked at switching, like one, the competitors weren't really that much, like after you got through whatever the teaser was, you know, five months free, whatever it was, it was more or less going to be the same amount. Two, it's like a triggering event that you have to like get your board involved right. with, send out a bunch of notifications. You got to reach out to every single one. You got to reach out investors. to every single one of your investors. And it's like not a great update. Like, hey, like we're, you know, we're moving your shares over like when, to. There, there's like an element of when you're talking to investors, people who have contributed potentially millions of dollars yeah. to you, like you want to be pretty judicious with how you communicate to them. Ideally, it's good news. Yeah. <laughs> You don't want to waste like these sort of uh, communications on just random shit that's like, okay, right. why are you bothering me with that? Like it's not going to buy you positive goodwill, yeah. right? You know, so so there's that issue. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, it, I think it takes away 
it definitely takes away some of the shine and, and luster of Carta as a business. I think it highlights the alternatives. This is a series of of issues that Carta's had over the course of the last 12 or 18 months. What was there was um, some, something the CEO was embroiled in some sort some of sort of scandal. issue associated with employees. I don't really know the details of it, but it got pretty ugly. And then he tried to he basically tried to triage that issue by sending out like a series of emails, which people weren't really familiar with what was going on. And then this kind of put kerosene on the fire and you know it was a PR disaster. So yeah, I mean, for a company that I think at one point in time looked like it was going to be, you know, a ten, fifteen, twenty billion dollar business, uh, I don't know. You know well, now- the the competition has been savage, as you've said. I mean, AngelList has been dunking all over Carta as much yeah. as they can. They're offering these spiffs where it's like, look, we'll manage your cap table for free right. for the duration of your remaining Carta contract. Yeah. Like basically, we're, we'll lose money on you guys or whatever it costs them. Uh, like I don't really know. I've never actually used any other service besides Carta, so I don't really know if one is better than the other or not. It doesn't. From what I've read on on X, from people that have made the switch, um, first off, like they they got it now so that you don't have to do all the things that we just said. So like it's kind of click a button and your cap table moves oh, sweet. over. Which you know, if that's actually true, that's a huge benefit. Um, two, the other companies that have that have gotten into this space are larger companies like angel s so like they're now at a point in time where they're feature parity um before it was you know some guy put together effectively like an air table thing and was trying to compete with carta and it wasn't really you didn't want your your cap table managed by a company that could go out of business and so there wasn't a lot of um you know desire to move over but now you've got big companies with great products that are offering better alternatives at a lower price like that's never good uh and you're exiting the one business where presumably you had the sustainable competitive advantage sure uh what what was this thing about the uh startup data that you were talking <laughs> yeah about? so startup data so q4 of last year data is out preliminary data uh series a companies um up materially i think it was from 30 roughly 30 million dollar valuations to about 45 million um so you know that's a 50 percent increase means that the bottom was definitely in in q2 of of last year in line with what we've been seeing generally speaking valuations went up across all different series with the exception of series c which is kind of like in this weird place between early stage and late stage Mm -hmm. the number of companies that are able to raise on paper has gone down. So like there's lower overall notional deal activity. But I really think that this is more about what I'm seeing within founder groups and my conversations, a shift in mindset. I'll say the thing that you're not supposed to say out loud. In 2020 and 2021, raising money was a KPI. Like it was something that you did as a founder because it felt like you were supposed to do it and it felt like an achievement, right? You wanted to get on the front page of Forbes or TechCrunch and it brought publicity and notoriety to your company. And even though it doesn't have, it's not a reportable metric in terms of the execution of the business, it was a metric that that other people cared about that brought additional uh, you know, resources to your business outside of just the capital. So a lot of founders wanted to raise big rounds. Um, it could not be any different in the beginning of 2024. Everyone I know, whether you run a very large company that at one point in time was worth billions of dollars and you know is sort of in limbo associated with valuation or whether you're just getting started the new thing is bootstrapping how do i get profitable as soon as possible so i'm not beholden to venture capital as you know basically my my only way to be able to exist and i think that's really healthy i mean i really do like i know from my perspective even though we have millions of dollars in the bank like my goal is Let's be profitable in 2024. And then that way you're in control of your own destiny. If you want to raise venture capital dollars to be able to fuel growth, fantastic. That's going to be available to you. I mean, venture capitalists would love to invest in profitable startups, especially ones that are able to achieve growth, you know, reasonable growth while remaining profitable. Um, you've seen big companies like uh, I just saw Uber CEO just did J. Cal's pod. You know, he's talking about taking the business from negative four or five billion dollars in free cash flow to positive two or three billion dollars in free cash flow over the course of the last few years and like how that number is probably going to go to ten billion dollars in free cash flow over the course of the next two to three years it's big companies it's small companies like it's a different it's a different dynamic and i just think i just think it's going to be very good in terms of you know valuation realistic value creation yeah it's interesting that you describe it as a kpi because i think it was just this narrative and this playbook that just seemed like 
the thing you were supposed you to do. You were supposed to do. Like you raise money, you hire a bunch of people, you keep growing at all, like growth at all costs. Yeah. Kind of like the underlying theme there. And when you look back at that time, and obviously we raised at that time as well, like what would you do anything differently now? Like if you look back and say like, you know, you we raised a bunch of money. It's helped us grow to the point that we're at today. We're in a pretty good position. I think timing wise, you killed it on the yeah. raise. Um, so fortunate in that sense. But like when you look back, like would you have done anything differently? Or, you know, if you were to start a new company today, would you do something differently? Like what, how would you advise people who are like kind of just starting out now? So I think like, I don't know if there's any blanket advice that's, uh, that sh is like universally applicable to all entrepreneurs. Like every entrepreneur is in a, a unique situation. It's unique, not just because of the company that they're starting and the product that they want to build, but also just the macro tailwinds or headwinds that they're facing at any particular moment in time. Um, so if you're building something like, you know, Brett Adcock, uh, is building like robots, I mean, if you want to have a robot company, like you're going to need hundreds of millions, billions of dollars. Um, but if you're a person today when you're saying like, okay, I want to go out and I want to build a profitable SaaS company um, and there's more AI tools and offshoring and there's a five to one or 10 to one multiplier on productivity as a result of some of these new tools, can you raise 500 or a million or 2 million or whatever, as opposed to 10 or 15 or 20 million and maybe your outcome is not a billion, two billion, three billion dollars in terms of your exit, but it's a hundred, two hundred million, um, and you know you maintain seventy five or eighty percent. You own way own, more of the company. You own way more of the company. Yeah, and like, and by the way, you just you sleep at night because you're not sitting there saying like, oh my god. I, I raised this crazy valuation. Like I've promised effectively triple digit growth, which is like everyone knows is not possible. Um, and so I think that's the the dynamic, which is like, okay, I'm, I'm going to raise the least amount of money possible in order to be able to build the product. And then I'm going to take that money and I'm going to get profitable. And then from there, I'm going to basically use my free cash flow to be able to grow the business organically. Um, and I, I just think that's like the right mindset. And if you want to raise venture capital dollars to be able to fuel growth, that's always going to be available to you. But as a result of more founders taking a more conservative um, uh, capital raising approach, VC is, is going to shrink. The total number of VC funds is already you know, it's deteriorating rapidly. I think, I think we talked about it in the prediction episode, but 38% of all venture capital funds didn't do a deal last year. And that's because the dirty secret of venture capital is that as an asset class, it doesn't scale. You cannot put $300 billion, which was the total AUM in uh, 2021 or 2022 into small startups and expect 20% returns. So I think, I think the old ultimate, like, rule here is that there was a lot of companies that probably weren't well suited to receiving venture capital that managed to raise venture capital over That's the right. preceding few years. Because like, just because you can grow revenue doesn't mean that you can ever become a profitable company, which if you think about like the companies that can exit at a sufficient valuation to return capital to the VCs that actually matches their model, which is you know, follows the power rule that you need like a couple companies to really like hit you with a thousand X type of return. Those companies that would be able to do that need to be able to either enter the public markets or be acquired at like a massive valuation. Right. When you're looking at later stage investors, they're looking at things like profits as opposed to just revenue growth. So it means that there was a lot of companies that probably should never have been able to raise venture capital that were able to. So does that mean that there will be fewer businesses created in the country or is it just like more? I think more businesses, but fewer publicly traded ones. So one of the other things that, that I've definitely started to notice is when I first was trading public equities on wall street, I didn't look at private markets in my early days for like the first five years of my career. I just didn't look at startups as much because I was only focused on publicly traded equities. And it felt like when the companies were going public, you were excited to buy them for the first time. Like when Uber and Twitter and you Snapchat and that. like, you know, we, we did the Facebook IPO. It was like an amazing opportunity. And then over the course of the last few years, the public market buyers have just become so much more discerning to the point where they're just like, we don't want to be the, we don't want to be the, basically the idiot that you sell yeah, exit liquidity, the exit the liquidity for the VCs. So the threshold in terms of where the company needs to be in order to have a successful IPO 
is just materially higher than it was two, three, four, five years ago. Um, like I think m the threshold now is probably like close to a hundred million dollars top line with a 70% plus gross margin. If you're a SaaS company and the majority of SaaS companies realistically just can't get that big. That's okay though, because like a lot of these SaaS companies, the reason why I think there's going to be more of them is because you can take two, three, four or five people and you can build a 25, 30, $50 million SaaS company. And I'm taking 50 million in revenue at a 70% gross margin. It's just never going to be a public company. Right. Um, it's never going to be a multi, multi-billion dollar It's just never going to be a multi-billion dollar company. A successful, profitable, smaller company. Yeah, it means that, you know, you and your buddies are going to argue over how to split $30 million a year, you know, in profit. Like, okay. <laughs> like, like, I think most people would probably sign up for that. Um, and, you know, I, I, I do think we're still early in this and like it needs to be proven out. Like, how effective are these AI tools? The world kind of runs off APIs. As I understand it, there's a lot of like implementation issues associated with utilizing AI from an engineering standpoint to get like the API suites to work. Um, so I'm not 100% sure it's as easy as the industry is making it out to be. I don't know if you saw, you know, Chamath is, is out with a new company, 8090, where they basically are like, tell us what you want us to build. We'll give you like, you know, 80% of the features at a 90% discount. I think he's serious. It's an <laughs> like they'll build whatever you want. Yeah. So like the obvious one would be like Salesforce, which is a company that hit a 52 week high today in their stock, but everyone complains about the quality of their product. So if I could build you 80% of the features of Salesforce and sell it to you for a 90% discount, you know, would you be interested in that? And the answer is like, obviously, yes, right? Interesting. So with that in mind, what what do you make of this like GPT store launch? Because this is like a way for, you know, regular people to build their own applications, leveraging some AI. Like I presume there will be competitive yeah. tools. I don't know if they're quite like SaaS products at this point, but like competitive tools to do things that typically we would be paying SaaS companies to do the likes of Salesforce or HubSpot or whatever, like what do you what do you make of the launch of this GPT store? Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, it comes at a really interesting time because one, you had a few different banks, including our our alma mater at Barclays, downgrade Apple to start the year. So you know, you have one of the largest companies in the world. I think the largest company in the world get downgraded. One of the magnificent seven, so it sends stocks and like kind of all of big cap tech down to start the year. Um, and we said last year, I said that we had an episode where I just like for the first time in my career. I would never be short Apple unless it was on like a pair trade basis, but I wouldn't own the stock because I think the iPhone cycle has come to an end. Like it doesn't feel like there's enough of a change from iPhone, whatever, 14 to 15 in order to be able to justify paying a $1,500 price for it. And at least on paper, they're nowhere right now with regard to AI. Um, I, I now think that Apple will have an AI product and that it'll probably be this year, this year probably at Q3, Q4 of this year. It's probably going to be in the realm of what we saw at CES, which is like a bunch of these people basically trying to do AI oriented assi uh, assistance. The, the amount of AI related things at CES this year was astounding. Did you see the one that the guys did from Rabbit? It was, it was like, it's whatever. Oh, that I'll, little, I'll, that I'll post it. Div, I'll, I'll give you the screenshot. You could post it. I tweeted at him. I said, do you realize that you named your revolutionary AI device after a vibrator? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, knowing today, they probably did it on purpose. Probably did it on purpose. <laughs> probably good for SEO. Yeah. That, that's that little like rectangle or square orange thing. It was a, yeah. So like, I think the problem that we are right now with regard to the GPT store is like, what's the form factor that it's delivered in? Because everyone wants to break the duopoly between Android and iOS and Google Play and the App Store. I get that. But unless you give me a, yeah, a like real... You, you, the method of delivery is I'm going to still use my phone my for phone. everything. So if you're not going to launch an alternative operating system or an alternative phone with an operating system, like how are you going to yeah. get them out? So I haven't gone to the GPT store. Like I haven't used the, the internet on my phone to go to the GPT store and then try to download an app. So I'm not 100% sure how that works. But if it is an app in the traditional sense, then I think Apple I, I is haven't done get that there. either. My, uh, my assumption is that it is like, uh, basically like when you use chat GPT, you, you know, like have a conversation and then ultimately you get a prompt. Like if you want to 
use it to create a new logo. Like you go back yeah. and forth with it and you're like, well, I want a flat logo that's this color and in this dimensions and it gives you an image. And you're like, actually, I like this. And like, you're going back and forth until finally you get like a beautiful logo and they're like, all right, use this style. Yeah. Now make me another one and then whatever. Um, and I think the store, my understanding is that it's like kind of gone through that whole, you know, prompting and programming process where it's like, all right, this is the tool where, you know, we I gave the bedtime story example a couple yeah. months ago. It's like, this is the one you just say, write me a new bedtime story okay. for rain. Like, I assume it's like more of a chat based thing than downloading an app, but I don't, I actually haven't used it on the phone yet either. Yeah. So I think like, uh, I'll check it out, but I think the form factor delivery is still in very much a work in progress. Um, you know, people are now coming out with some various apps for Apple's new headset. You know, those seem like they're going to be in a place where it could be potentially useful for certain applications. And but do you know if they're, are they launching those like on their existing app store? Or are they like doing like a new generative AI app store? Who, Apple? Yeah. No, it's on the existing. Just the existing. Yeah, but it's for the form factor. Right. You know, so for like, the Vision Pro. For the Vision Pro. Um, but again, like, okay, so they, like that's Apple's hardware and right. they're developing an app store for a new hardware device. Like, I still think there's an issue in terms of Vision Pro is not going to sell a billion units. Um, so until we really get to the place where you can take an AI application and put it on a piece of hardware that Apple doesn't own, I don't really see how you circumvent them in, in this whole, you know, ecosystem. Uh, it's not the Game Boy thing that, that came out <laughs> and it's not the, uh, it's, the, I mean, on the pin company that we put up there, yeah, if I yeah. get humane or whatever, yep. they've already laid off like 20 or, I mean, four year build process, launch, whatever. And I think they've already laid off like 20 or 30%. That's kind of sad because I feel like they just got to that point where people know who they are and now they're, you know, clearly wasn't able to sustain. Well, you talk about, again, like we talk about companies that are raising venture capital, like what are you building? If the answer is like, we're building an AI, whatever, and we're putting it in our own hardware. Okay. Like you need hundreds of millions of dollars to do that. You don't really get the benefit of like striking out with your first product. Like your first product has to be at least yeah. a semi-success. Um, and when you don't, when you don't have a semi-success after there's not a lot to build on and like investor confidence goes, you know, way yeah, down. Because and there's no reason for them to like keep pumping money into your company and keep double, like that's not going to allow them to achieve the type of return that they need. No. Like the model is we need a couple companies to hit a massive grand slam home run, whatever you want to call it. And I can't put in like 20 million, 30 million, hundred million dollars into your company and get like a, even if it was a, you know, positive exit, I'm yeah. not going to do it. So it is, it is a challenging time for those types of companies. Um, I think the issue with Apple, like when I look at the downgrades that kind of uh, flooded the market, the issue is people are doubting Apple's ability to innovate. So there's no reason to buy the iPhone 15. Yeah. I said it a couple months ago. The same is true today. I don't know a single person who has one. Right. Or nobody at least is telling me like, oh shit, you got to get one because this is so cool. Like, right. I've not had a single conversation. Whereas, you know, a few years ago, there was always something that was like, and it, and it was like declining over time, but like there was still certain things that are like, oh, you got to get the new one. There now. was lines and like, you know, every, like the yeah. reporters would go out to the to the Apple store on Fifth Avenue in New York and people were sleeping outside for days to be able to get it. And like, like I, if that is still happening, it's not making news anymore. Yeah, like it's just a mature product. And obviously they have like billions of people who already have it in their hands. So yeah. It's not like, you know, there's as much white space for them to go out, at least in the developed markets. You know, there's places like China where, a lot of the homegrown uh, products, like Chinese native products, uh, have a higher share than you would see in, in the U.S., obviously. So, you know, there is an opportunity in places like that. But, you know, as far as product life cycles go, the iPhone is a pretty mature product. Yeah. Um, but I think people have just lost faith in Apple's ability to innovate. And I do think that they will come out with a AI, uh, AI generative AI tool this year, it'll obviously work super well on the iPhone. Right. Um, and that's kind of been their strength so far. I think the Vision Pro has been, you know, they'd had a very loud, like, announcement. And then since then, I don't really hear Well, it's a super about limited it. run. I forget what the, what the total unit was, but, like, you know, a fraction of what an iPhone run is. And I don't think the goal is to, was to, like, make that product commercially successful from a financial standpoint. Uh, you know, the, the, right off the bat, I think it's like, okay, is there something here that yeah, like, do people like it? Do what people like it? Yeah. Can we solicit from this. And then to continue to evolve the form factor into something that 
eventually is like this watch, right? right. Where it's like a, an actual wearable device. Um, side note, like I, I kind of make fun of the Facebook Ray-Ban things, but people are pretty bullish on that. And like really? in, ter in terms of it's like utility or whatever. So uh, have, do you know people who have it? I've just watched the videos on like YouTube and X and stuff like that. And like, maybe they're just paid spokesmen. <laughs> I, don't hey, know. I, don't know, I, I saw but. a guy, I saw a video of a guy who like did his proposal, like to his fiance yeah. or now fiance, like wearing the glasses. And at first I was like, how is he doing it? Then you realize it's the, but he, there was no, like, it was like basically just like a camera in there. I don't know that there was any cool, like AR VR stuff. At least maybe he didn't know how to do yeah. it. Maybe that's not out, but you know, yeah, I guess it's I guess it's nice to have that. Right. The area that I'm seeing though that is making leaps and bounds. One, we did all of our images on our website. We hope it's amazing. Mid journey continues to blow me away. Um, so like I think the art creation that's moving faster than anybody. You know, Mid Journey, by the way, did not raise a single dollar. Not a single capital. dollar. Crazy to think about. Twenty guys. I think the t the entire team was like twenty people that got together, made a decision that they were going to build an incredible company and they were going to bootstrap it. My guess is like they've come from, I don't know the, I, I know the founders, not personally, but I know the founder, who the founders are. I'm not 100% sure everyone was like financially taken care of prior to mid journey. But they already had like some. Yeah. Like, like I mean, it, it's a, it's a luxury to be able to say, okay, we're going to, we're going to work yeah, on a company. Basically that means years. you're putting in your own money. Yeah. Right. So, but whatever the case is, I mean, like now it's obviously a, a multi-billion dollar company that is creating incredible products and has tremendous momentum with no outside, you know, VC money in it. Um, another, probably the most successful bootstrap story. Um, Pika, the, the AI generated. Yeah. We, oh, you, we talked about this a while ago. I haven't seen anything recently. Awesome. The video, they're like, teaser promo video was insane. Dude, I mean, like, the same, like, when, I remember when Toy Story and Wally, -E, like, all the stuff that was coming out of Pixar, like, multi-year long projects involving hundreds of animators and graphic designers and engineers, and, like, now you can do that in, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 minutes. Like, you could literally <laughs> do, like, Wally -E in, like, a day. I mean, all I mean, these, so, like, now the question is, like, how do you, you know, they're, they're, uh, OpenAI is getting into all these, like, licensing conversations with the publishers, right. obviously, the New York Times, and then I saw a slew of other publishers that they're talking to. You know, they're they're trying to figure out kind of the copyright issues here and the intellectual property issues there, assuming that gets solved and there's like some equitable way where, you know, if your IP is being used, you're compensated. Like, it's going to be crazy. You got to, I mean, like, you got to think that the publishers, though, it's same thing with music, right? They, you fight for, you, you put up as much of a fight as you can in the beginning, but eventually you acquiesce because like, this is, this is the next, thing. this is happening. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like whether or not the only question is like, whether you're going to be around <laughs> and if you fight it for too long, like you won't be. So I don't think that the leverage is in favor of, of New York times. I think the leverage is in favor of the LLM players. Um, and I think they end up getting like a deal that's probably pretty favorable, but you saw OpenAI's numbers, like they're at 25% gross margin. I mean, for a software business, you're supposed to be at 75%. It's a very different model. It's a super different model. So there's not like a, they're not making a ton of money, you know, like they're, I'm not even saying like, I'm not even saying that they're intentionally losing. I'm saying like where the gross margin is, it's not set up at a place where if, you know, they, they continue to ramp at that level that they would be like hyper profitable yeah. in the way that like a Google or whatever. Yeah, the, the compute costs are so high. So high. That they're not able to squeeze out the same kind of margins as a, you know, traditional SaaS business. And like, you know, coming back to what you said about the bar being so much higher for companies going public today, like when I was at Capital Group, like we would, you know, we looked at a ton, a lot of the, big uh, tech companies that are out there, we looked at their IPOs and I wouldn't even touch one of these companies if the, you know, gross mar if 25% gross margin just like wasn't in the profile of investments that we were looking at. Like, Auto delete. Yeah, like, I don't know. There, There's a different team who's looking yeah. at it. Well, it wasn't us. Um, and, <laughs> and like, you need, you need to be, depending on, like, there's like a kind of inverse relationship between the scale that you're at and the growth we would look at. But like, if you're a company debuting with like, you know, 500 million to a billion dollars in revenue, we better be seeing like 30, 35% top line growth, otherwise automatic disqualification. And a lot of these companies today, like far smaller, far lower growth rates and no like discernible path to profitability. Yeah. So, you know, there, there's clearly a new paradigm with these types of companies. And maybe it's just like margin profile is different. 
growth prospects are different. It's you're not trying to achieve the billion dollar exits, multi billion dollar exits that we talked about, but maybe you're actually building shit that people use. Yeah. And maybe you can just enjoy your life. <laughs> yeah. You know, build <laughs> yeah. like build a profitable company, not be as stressed out, be okay with having one house instead of five and like chill. <laughs> yeah. One house instead of five. So, <laughs> so sad. People can't even get one today. <laughs> I know. Uh, let's move to the final trade. Let's do it. Bill Ackman is setting up a think tank to battle it out against Harvard Business Insider and anyone else he can think of. Is Ackman going to come out on top? Yes, he is. This is the most entertaining thing on the internet. I am <laughs> such a Billy Ackman fan. Go, Bill, go. Boeing is being sued by the passengers of an Alaska Airlines flight after the door fell off the plane in midair. Do the passengers have a case? I don't know, man. If you see a chair fly out of the window, your ears are bleeding, your head is ringing, I'm long the passengers on this one. The Wall Street Journal reported that Tesla execs are very worried about Elon Musk's supposedly prolific drug use. Is this a real issue? I don't know. Elon's going to Elon. Shareholders have been pretty happy so far. Don't fix what ain't broken. Doquan of Terra Luna Infamy could be extradited to the United States as early as March. Is he doing time? I think SBF is clearing out the top bunk for him right now. Doquan headed to prison for sure. Tiger Woods and Nike are splitting up after 27 years together. Is Nike making a mistake? They're making a huge mistake. Nike paid Tiger $600 million over the course of 20 years. He made them over $60 billion in market cap. Charlie Woods is Tiger 2.0 should be signing him ASAP. BlackRock is buying infrastructure firm GIP for $12.5 billion. Is this a good deal? The big just keep getting bigger. Love this deal with the infrastructure bill in play. A lot of money going into this space. All right, guys, that's it for this week's episode of the Atlas Pod. Please make sure that you subscribe, like, comment, and share. And as always, Cheval and I will be back next week with another episode. <laughs>